Hey people, here's your governor with a message for you, and you should listen to it because it happened to me. But discrimination isn't always that obvious. Sometimes more subtle, but in many ways more insidious. An institutionalized discrimination that's hidden behind a smiling face. It is Tuesday, January 11, 2011. I'm at the home of Mr. Curtis. He is a person. Hey, you there? Okay. Yeah, this is the whistleblower, the federal whistleblower. Okay. Uh, at the New York skyline. Go ahead. Bang! That's what I'm talking about. Woo! Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're getting deep here. What's this? Oh, just some, um, you know, whoa, part, of history, whoa. part of history. Part of history. You go ahead, brother. You go it's ahead. Sad, but it's part of history. Part of history. So this is the big Watusi man, Dingo Mix Super Field Negro. Yes. All right. Well, you know, I, I, I put that whole skit together, and I finally see what it's supposed to That's what I'm talking about. One of your brethren um, drew that. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. One brother from Haiti did yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Outstanding. Nice place. Well, we can see you're not you're not one of the impoverished, downtrodden, who's like one of these guys right here. Oh no, no. See, no. that's Martin Luther King, that's Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, Frederick Douglass, all right here. And then this brother right here is what? Bang! Got the chains on his brain. When these guys do not, those guys are out there. And this guy is not. And that slave castle's door is busted and the key's right there. And he still ain't walking away from that. Scared to leave. Damn! Scared to leave. And that's my guy right here. That's my guy right here, Malcolm X. That's him right here. Well, let me see what else we got here. But, oh my. This is the one! Yeah. Yeah, that's the one you were asking about. If that story was true about it, yes, that's it. That's what you 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 had given me a copy of this, and I took it to the congressman's office. Yes. And you met with Ida Smith. I was there. I was an eyewitness. Bang! We're gonna have to send this to Mr. Juan Cuba at the White House. Sure. sure. Okay, and I've got a letter from the Justice Department, and I've been trying to show people, you know, what exactly, and people of authority. Because the newspapers have been, they don't want to print my story no more about the redlining scheme that I took to the congressman's office. And they did all kinds of things, calling me crazy, defamed me. The VA gave me a whole bunch of medication, which in fact I didn't need as a chemical restraint. So I got to do what I got to do. But I did speak uh, to Mr. Juan Cuba. And it's time for me to now... And the last time I spoke to him was about getting those books to him. Okay. And now those books have disappeared at the congressman's office. Wow. So we can actually send him this. But what I wanted to do right now was if you could please take me back. Take me back to what happened for you have taken these pictures. Hold this for me. Of this hangsman's noose. That was when. This wasn't a... This was found, um, it was in the locker room at the VA. At the, okay, the Veterans Administration what? St. Albans, New York. St. Albans, New York, Veterans Administration, motor pool locker room? Yes, correct. Okay, and how long was this hanging there? Um, I don't know, I walked in January 25th, 2008, and I saw it. But, um, now, January 25th, 2008, and that's when you first saw that. Correct. And it last and stayed there for how long? No, they took it down immediately after that, after um, the police were notified. Oh, so you called the police after that. There was a police report. Yes, correct. The police never called the press on this? No. When you took it to the congressman's office, did they call the press? What happened when you went to Ida M. Smith after I turned you over to her? Um, she spoke to me a few times about it, but nothing amounted out of it. I didn't get any feedback. I didn't get any change. Um, and they told me that the federal government says it's legal to hang them. 
They said it's not. Ida it. Smith told you said that the federal government said it's legal to put a hangman's noose. They said that they're not illegal, but a noose is not against the law by the federal government. But a swastika is considered a felony hate crime, where a noose is not considered a hate crime. And Ida M. Smith told you this. Um, yeah, in the discussion, she was like, there was nothing she could do about it. Because okay. And do, are you aware that she ever contacted anybody at the Veterans Administration? Um, I believe she spoke to the union. Outside of that, I don't think um, it went much. And then better. what happened to you? Uh, nothing. They offered to um, transfer me to Brooklyn, Manhattan, or Staten Island. In other words, get you out of the St. Albans VA. Yes. Did they talk to you about... Who put that there? Did anybody ever ask you who put that Hangman's noose in the locker room at the Brooklyn VA? I mean at the St. Albans VA on January 25th, 2008. No. No. Do you know who did it? Um, I don't know who did it, but I know whose coat rack it was hung on. I found it. It was hanging on one of my co-workers. Um, co what was the name of the person's coat rack it was hanging on? Yes. Frank Castellano. Frank Castellano. Correct. What happened to Mr. Frank Castellano after you reported this? Um, actually, he got a promotion from work leader to supervisor. And they wanted me to work <laughs> under him after that. And then I told them that they were adding insult to injury. They asked me, they told me when I told them I didn't want to work under his supervision after the incident. Yes. They told me that they can transfer me to Brooklyn, Staten Island, or Miami. Which I refuse to go because I like St. Albans. I've been there 20 years and I feel that I should not be transferred. Now, were there other instances with Mr. Castellano or other Caucasian gentlemen at the Brooklyn VA Hospital Motor Pool that would lead you to think that this, there, is an, there is an embedded racist environment in that motor pool? Yes. I would think so. Because, Elaborate, yeah. please. Well, um, a brief incident to me was happened about roughly about 15 years ago. I came in there as a motor pool operator, as a motor vehicle operator, and shortly after that, two Caucasians came in there, and they were made grade eights, and I was made a I was a grade seven, and when I brought it to their attention, saying, "How come I'm a seven and they're eight? They told me when I um, get an ACDR license, they'll make me a grade 8. Immediately, within two to three seconds, I reached in my pocket, handed them a class A CDL license. And they kept promising me to give me the grade, and they never did. So there's, at the time, there were three tractor operators, which me being one, the first one, mm -hmm. and then the two Caucasians that came after me. So it was... You had more time in grade, more time in service than they did. Yes, and they were made eight when they walked in the door. Okay. And I was never. Here it is, 17 years later, and I'm still a seven. So it looked like you sound like somebody, or the federal government owe you some money. Yeah, with some interest. And back with pay. some interest and back pay. Yeah, 17 years. About pay, a little pain and suffering, a little humiliation and degradation. And then this is what I'm rewarded with. And See, bang! Yes. That's what your, you, you... You know Frank Castellano did it, don't you? I would surmise that it does belong to him. You suspect him? Yes. Now, tell me about the other guy who put a little hangman's noose in the hands of that female six months ago at the Brooklyn VA. You can tell it. You're a federal whistleblower. You should be protected. And we're sending this to the White House. Well, um... Another co-worker of mine, I heard um, they had an incident too where somebody hand, personally handed them a noose. Person hand, so a white guy handed a black woman a, black a hangman's woman. noose yeah. and he ended up getting fired. Yes. And, she, and not right now, she's on leave uh, with mental distress. Correct. Well, what happened to you? How come you ain't all shell-shocked? I am shell-shocked. It's a challenge each and every day to go to work. Matter of fact, it's um, hard talking about it, even like right now. Um, I want to stop talking about it right now. Did you go see some people, man? Yeah, I did. But I can't get into your medical records, yeah. man. I can't, I'm not going to get into that with you. Now, why don't you tell me your name? Tell me your name, and Give me give me the name. My I got to have Curtis. a name. Curtis. Bench. Curtis? Bench. You work at the Brooklyn VA? St. Albans. St. Albans VA? Correct. And you've been there 20 years? 22 years and 8 months. 
22 years in April, yeah. and you're a whistleblower. Correct. Are you afraid something's going to happen to you? Um, yeah, I am. I am. I am. On a day-to-day -day basis, just going to work with the atmosphere and just all of the stuff that goes on and transpires. Oh, don't talk to him. He's a troublemaker. And it's So they've been slandering your name. Correct. You've been profiled. Correct. As a troublemaker. For standing up for my rights of um, not wanting to see a noose in a federal facility. And you went to your congressman's office and they blew what? But discrimination isn't always that obvious. It's sometimes more subtle, but in many ways more insidious. An institutionalized discrimination that's hidden behind a smiling face. Housing agents who say, well, there are no vacancies right now. That you just didn't qualify for the mortgage because your financial credit history wasn't good enough. Last year, the Federal Reserve Board found African Americans are denied credit for homes at twice the rate white Americans are. And it is pervasive. It's what we found in the banking case in Texas, SACU Bank in Texas. Discrimination in lending, discrimination in uh, rendering mortgages. The bank has agreed to change its practices, as you heard from the Assistant Secretary. The bank has also agreed to a $2.1 billion, billion dollar agreement where they'll make $2.1 billion available to families who are low and moderate income across the country for mortgages, about 15,000 low and moderate income people will now be able to buy their own home because of the settlement we announced today. $2.1 billion is by far the largest settlement ever rendered to the federal government to settle a fair housing case. And in closing, the message of today is clear. You've heard it from a number of us now. This is a nation of laws, and this administration will enforce the laws. We'll take Questions at this time? Yes, sir. For $2.1 billion that would not have been available to families of low and moderate income, uh, income, uh, low and moderate income families across the country, about 15,000 families, we estimate, estimate, will get mortgages who would not have gotten mortgages otherwise. But aggressively, to take a greater risk on these mortgages, yes. To give families mortgages who they would not have given otherwise, yes. They would not have qualified but for this affirmative action on the part of the bank, yes. Minorities are represented in that low and moderate income group? It is uh, it's by income and is it also by minorities? Yes. With the $2.1 billion lending that uh, amount in mortgages, which will be a higher risk, and I'm sure there will be a higher default rate on those mortgages than on the rest of the portfolio. Uh, that is that is the remedy that we sought and the remedy that I would prefer, 15,000 families. This is of a scope so uh, beyond anything that we've really done in the past. Uh, we had one settlement just a couple of weeks ago, which was part and parcel of this, which is in the range of about a billion dollars. But after that, the closest uh, settlement was 300, 400, 500,000 dollars. So this is of a scope uh, uh, that much surpasses anything we've done in the past. There was the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA, passed in 1977 during Jimmy Carter's first year in office. The law increased oversight of financial institutions to ensure that they were giving credit to low-income families. We're going to make sure those banks do it and they don't discriminate. 
but the law went overboard. Institutions made loans they probably didn't want to make because they couldn't seem racist. It empowered these community groups who would then bully the banks. ACORN bullied the banks. Indeed, ACORN, the Associations of Community Organizers for Reform Now, would before long come up with a new tactic, challenging a thrift merger in Illinois, claiming they didn't make the kind of loans that ACORN felt were required under the CRA. A young community organizer named Barack Obama worked closely with the ACORN activists behind the new strategy. Uh, I've been a community organizer and helped design programs at the ground level. And that strategy worked. ACORN prevailed in court, and soon credit standards were being lowered across the country. While at first Fannie actually resisted buying up some of those shaky mortgages, at the tail end of the Clinton administration, Fannie Mae was told to substantially increase the percentage of those mortgages in its portfolio. ACORN's attorney was, well, you guessed it, Barack Obama. You know, I have a background as an attorney. Uh, I've represented affordable housing organizations that build affordable housing, something that's a major issue in the district. Back in the 1990s, they used strong-arm tactics to force banks to give high-risk loans to low-income borrowers with bad credit. Well, ACORN uses a militant tactics. They call it direct action. Sometimes ACORN will actually send people to a bank official's home. Uh, they'll scare him, they'll scare his kids, again, all in an effort to get the banks to make these bad loans. You've gone back to Chicago right. and civic rights, civil right. rights. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm currently a, 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 a practicing civil rights lawyer, uh, which means that I get involved in a whole range of different uh, issues uh, that touch on issues of race. look at the subprime mortgage fiasco t uh, that's taking place today. Subprime lending started off as a good idea, helping Americans buy homes who previously couldn't afford to. Financial institutions created new financial instruments that could securitize these loans, slice them into finer and finer risk categories, and spread them out among investors and around the country, as well as around the world. In theory, this should have allowed mortgage lending to be less risky, and more diversified. Who do you think is to blame for this current mortgage and credit crisis? Uh, who do we see about that? Well, I, I think uh, there are a lot of folks who have to take some responsibility. The original idea was a good one, which was let's see if we can distribute risk more broadly and make it easier to provide loans to people who otherwise might be, not be able to get them. Now up until then, ACORN has managed to fly below the radar, but their dangerous practices are coming back to haunt them and the rest of the country. The economic crisis facing the nation is due in large part to this disastrous decision by financial institutions Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to buy up risky loans from small banks. But it's groups like ACORN that force those banks to give out those loans in the first place. What do you think of the ACORN scandal and how do you think it will affect the election? The ACORN scandal is a big one. ACORN has received over $760 million in fees alone. This is what we know about. And there's a lot of stuff that's still kind of bubbling up to the surface. Uh, but here's an organization that essentially helps strong arm a lot of banks into uh, making loans to people who couldn't pay them off, so the so-called ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets. Uh, at the heart of what has kind of brought about the financial collapse is this uh, rather unconventional idea uh, that we would just loan money out uh, if a person had a pulse. Eight years they had a chance the other side here to get this economy right. Eight years! And they're the ones that drove it into the ground and dares criticize when someone is turning it around so that we go in the right direction. Eight years. This didn't happen overnight when we start losing jobs. When President Bush left office, we were losing 750,000 jobs a month. What did they do? Nothing. Then you have President Obama come on board. 
started turning things around. And what do they do? Criticize. Criticize progress of creating jobs again. Criticize trying to create an opportunity for Americans to have good health care again. Criticize the fact that we are able to improve bridges and roads. Criticize the fact that we're going to be able to put more people uh, to approve the money to help the unemployed. Eight years of driving the economy into the ground. One year. Obama had one year, President Obama, to make sure that we begin to restore America to the prosperity that we had eight years prior to the Bush administration. Let's continue to move in the right direction. Hey, everybody, this is Dr. Phil Joyce. This is a story about a man who busted the NYPD out of the Queens District Attorney's Office coming to the Queens Central Library trying to kill me or snatch my ass up so I'd never be seen again. Let's take a look at what he says. The police right there today is June 5th, 2011. There goes the police right there. Right now we're in front of the library. We're talking to one of my friends here because we're homeless people. Like, I am a homeless guy. We are homeless, okay? I know I can go stay with my mom, my Russian mom, and how it be. But they had exiled me out the ghetto. Uh, what do I do around here? I make every Negro want to rebel and revolt. Yeah, I make Negroes want to rebel and revolt. That's what I do around here. You're being mistreated. Now tell me your story about the homelessness right here. And then tell me about the detectives. So tell me about the detectives coming over here looking for me. Stay right there, stay right there. Detectives will come here in the library. They have regular NYPD outside. They have the undercover homeless hanging out at the library. Uh-huh. I will come in and out. I just got they even had the uh, cops that were playing homeless hanging out in the library. Yep. Undercover Detectives, library. undercover cops that were playing homeless in the library. Who are they looking for? You. That's right. And did they tell y'all why? Nope. But don't you think it must have been a pretty big deal <laughs> for them to orchestrate such a big deal for one little guy, just me, one little Haitian French green card guy, who will not be a good nigga in America. Can I help? Trans with your story, bro. I just made it in the homeless shelter, and in the homeless shelter system, there's nowhere to be that you can take a felony and everything. There's no job, minimum wage is about to get locked down. They're yeah, only giving you 20 hours, they only hire for security. And you did see that newspaper article that was in the New York page that said that there were no homeless. Show me the homeless. Remember that one? They're all over, but they got homeless in um, 42nd Street, Grand Central. They sit on the inside. I put them on the wall street. I met the shelter system. Letting you know over by Port Authority, there's a section for the homeless right at Port Authority. Now, do you see why I allowed myself to be evicted to live with the homeless and to do this? Because that's what right can. I got special forces training, I'm a fairly educated guy, and I spent all my money on black people. I was supposed to hate my ass. But guess what? Look, man, we just try to live as human beings. Them black leaders ain't shit. And I'm talking about Congressman Meeks, you piece of shit. I'm talking about State Senator Huntley. I just put you out of freaking business by giving your Attorney General information against you and your whole family busted and you're out of office. So all the other black elected officials of the 5th Congressional District shaking in their freaking boots right now on September 29, 2012, and I'm in a homeless shelter for veterans. <laughs> Can you find me to kill me? <laughs> Bang! That's what I'm talking about. Now, I gotta regain my economy and get to Canada, because this country's destroyed me so bad and hurt me so bad as a veteran that I'm ashamed and embarrassed. I am ashamed and embarrassed to be an American soldier because this country is a traitor country and ain't nobody trying to really help me. I'm taken as a crazy man 
that's the reason why I'm in this place where I'm at right now. So, thanks America. I appreciate everything you done did. Let's go over my life. And all your enemies that want you, I ain't one of those enemies. But as far as being your friend, um, I can be that when I'm in Canada and I ain't here. I don't even hear English spoken in Quebec province. Thank you very much. I'm a French green card guy. So uh, I'm happy for you and your great empire and all your weapons and all your mass destruction and selling entertainment as love. And I got to go to another country, find a wife, because I can't afford one in the United States of America. Thank you very much. Because if I don't go into goddamn slavery for a Negro or a female, um, there's no love to be found. There's no love. So thank you and you and all your baby kids and all your bastard baby kids and all your charity and all the 7% Romney says is depending on the government. I don't need the government. Thank you very much. You can keep your Obama and your Congressman Meeks, your State Senator Huntley, your State Senator Malcolm Smith, your Assemblywoman Vivian Cook who's got cancer and nobody knows that she's going to get chemotherapies incapacitated and she don't s switch over power. People are not being represented. It's just a whole bowl of fraud and a bowl of crap. Thank you very much, America. Thank you very much. Let me show you. Thank you. Thank you for making me a piece of shit because of my skin color. You have your nice freaking day. Bye-bye. Dr. Joyce, I'm in downtown Jamaica. This is in front of the Coliseum. Let me go see one of my boys. The policeman over here, that's what I suspect. Oh, there my boy right here. What's happening? I'm good. Long time no see and everything. Yeah, man, I've been hiding out from the police. Oh, yeah, because they had you all around with the papers that you wanted something. I don't know what happened. They had me wanted in the paper? Yeah. They've been showing it around. All these stores I had. They went to every store. They asked me why I know you never got told them I've never seen you. You're goddamn right. <laughs> You know what I do? Now, have I been spending my money, my life, and everything helping everybody in this community? Oh, yeah, since I know you know, since first time I saw you, you had that. Uh, uh, the school, yeah, the, the Segway. Since I met, uh, met you, know, you That's got to be at least five years. More than that. Yo, man, they just throughout my life. The congressman orchestrated a death threat against himself. I had the DA's office hunting me. I got interviewed with the people from the library that they had undercover cops playing homeless. Uh, Even when I was homeless, did I ever look homeless? <laughs> Love you, brother. Right. Thanks a lot, man. No I, you know, I know the boy. I said hi, but I got a one now. Thank you, brother. Love you, man. Thank you. Goodbye to Mrs. Green, because by the time they figure out how I did all this videotaping, uh, people being neglected, warehouse in here. I'll never be built like back in here. But if you die before I do, tell God not to forgive Congressman Mix, not to forgive New York State Senator Huntley, not to forgive New York State Senator Malcolm Smith. Vivian Cook has cancer. She's going to die real soon, about three, four, five years, whatever it is. She shouldn't. Li she should live very long, so she can suffer a long time. New York State, uh, uh, New York City Councilman Leroy Conway, he runs her for an abomination.
This is Sunday night, 8 o'clock at night, and these are the people. Look at this. Look at that. Look at that. And she's right there. That's Mrs. Green. Hooked up to a machine. Being fed. These liquid supplements. And this is the warehousing of these old people. For $140,000 a year. I can't. Mrs. Green. The reason why my life got destroyed was because I saved your life and protected you about the $20,848,000 class by Hosea Mitchell who lives in apartment 10K at Shelton House, New York City Housing Authority. Somebody help me out here, man. My life's been destroyed, everything. You hear these people yelling in here? This is the woman that was thought to be dead. She's not dead. She's not dead. She's right here. <laughs> She's right here at Highland Care, and that's her roommate, okay? She is not dead. Mrs. Green did not die. I've been coming here for years. I kept a secret. I knew all this. I told everybody where she was, but they covered it up. The district attorney's office, Creedmoor Psychiatric, Human Resource Administration, Adult Protective Services. Everybody covered this up. And the district attorney knows because I, I charmed Bianca into giving her the thing to go to my website and the DA calling me, wanting me to come in there so they can arrest me and abuse me. Not going to happen. They come and get me, they can come and get me. But you better have a search warrant, you better have an arrest warrant. That's all I know. This is the victim of a Nazi copycat crime that Mayor Michael R. Bloomberg covered up. What can I tell you? This is what they look like when they're in a nursing home, dying. And they're just an economy being warehoused because they put them out of their house in public housing so they can harvest the apartments and they dump them in a nursing home. And when they go to the hospital visiting nurse service, social workers get money when they refer them to certain nursing homes. Go ahead. He can vomit and choke on his own puke. He vomits, he chokes, and dies on his own puke. That's what I'm talking about. He vomits and chokes on his own puke. When's that going to happen? Go ahead. Go ahead. That's what I expose in order to get people to do their damn job. That's what I expose in order to get people to do their damn job. I'll never see these people again in life because I am the housing worker. Today